Okay, hi, my name's Angela. My derby name is Nitty. I am a referee and non-skating official at Rose City Rollers. And I've also been a beekeeper for almost seven years. So um, I've been wanting to do a beekeeping class. Um, I do beekeeping classes at my home, but not for derby people. And a number of derby friends had asked if they could come over and see my hives. And I thought this spring was the time that I was going to do it. And because we're now in a lockdown, um, I still wanted to share them with folks, but we're gonna do it this way instead. So we're gonna have a PowerPoint presentation and a series of short videos. So like Kat said, if you have questions as we go along, feel free and, and drop them in the chat and she's gonna help pass those along to me. Um, I do want folks to understand that the class is only one hour long. So normally an intro to beekeeping would be a series of three classes. So it's, it's not gonna cover everything. So you're definitely probably gonna have questions. I wanted to help folks get a little bit of a look and an understanding at how I do beekeeping, the style of hive that I keep, the philosophy of beekeeping that I follow, and sort of what it looks like to get in and work with a hive, as well as what your time expectations and financial obligations are when you are a beekeeper. So there's going to be a lot of things we don't have time to cover, um, but hopefully it'll get you interested and um, answer some of those initial questions that you have and spark your interest in, in beekeeping maybe because I hope everybody would want to be a beekeeper. I'm really passionate about it. And it is sort of a, a low time commitment hobby and you get to have like 10 or 20 or 40,000 pets in your backyard. So um, that don't ask very much of you. So I'm, I really enjoy it as a hobby. So um, Kat, is it okay if I pull up the PowerPoint? Are we, do you feel like we're ready to start that? I'm gonna keep yeah, I think, we've, okay. I think this, the crawl slowed down a bit. So let's just go ahead and get okay. started. So um, I'm going to share my screen with you and see if we can get this going here. Okay. Um, all right. So this class is going to be about um, top bar beekeeping. So you can see from the picture here, uh, a top bar uh, beehive looks different than the typical kind of hive you think of as a stack of white boxes. A top bar hive is a horizontal hive and it, the name is very self-explanatory. It's a series of bars set on top of the hive. So the bees uh, build across horizontally and this is what it looks like. Obviously there's a lot of bees um, because the lid is off of the hive, they're all coming out to figure out what's going on. But this gives you an idea about what a top bar hive looks like. And I have had a Langstroth hive, uh, the traditional stack of boxes, and I prefer top bar beekeeping. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. So I wanted to talk really quickly about uh, bees in general, because as a beekeeper, every spring and summer, I get people messaging me or texting me asking if I can come get bees out of their yard for them. And if you have honeybees in your yard and you live in the Portland area, I would love to come catch a swarm and put it in my empty hive or give it to friends that need them. But um, more than 50% of the time, what people are contacting me about are not honeybees. So I wanted to just give a little overview to make sure that we're going to be talking about honeybees here. So um, honeybees are an insect of the genus Apis. There's several species of them that are kept around the world for honey production. In North America, we keep introduced European honeybees. So they're not an invasive species, but they are not native. There are more than 4,000 species of native bees in the US, and most of those are solitary and stingless. A lot of people are familiar with mason bees, which are a significant pollinator of fruit tree orchards. Um, but there are many, many, many other species, and a lot of them live in the ground, and a lot of them are solitary. And a lot of them are so small, you wouldn't even recognize them as a bee. So. Uh, when people contact me and they ask me to come remove a hive, uh, I'd say 20% of the time they're asking me to come remove a, a bumblebee nest out of the ground, um, which bumblebee nests are of short duration. They only are around for a couple of months and you're best to leave them alone. They're not very, um, they tend to be docile unless you get a shovel into them, right? Um, they tend to be not a problem in your yard. And if you can leave them alone and let them complete their life cycle, that's awesome. And their colonies typically have a couple hundred bees in them and they do have a queen, but they don't produce honey. The most common thing I get is people asking me to remove uh, a swarm or colony of bees and they're actually yellow jackets. So yellow jackets are not bees. Um, bees are not wasps. 
Yellow jackets are of the genus Vespula and they are a species of wasp. In Oregon, we also have the bald hornet, which is not a true hornet. It is a very large species of yellow jacket. Um, so the easiest way to tell if you are looking in your yard and you see a colony of some kind of winged insect is that honeybees are fuzzy and yellow jackets have a waxy aerodynamic look to them. But if you're not sure if it's a bee or a wasp, if it's fuzzy, it's gonna be a bee. Um, so unlike the solitary bees that we have in Oregon and mason bees and ground nesting bees, honeybees are a super organism. So for me as a beekeeper, that's really helpful because you are inevitably going to squish bees when you work in a hive. And if you can sort of um, understand and think of the colony as one giant organism, it's easier to get in there and work with them and sometimes um, have the necessary job of squishing bees. Um, whether intentional or unintentional. We'll talk about later why you might intentionally be squishing bees. So um, the colony is comprised of the queen bee. She goes on a mating flight, mates with several males, and then starts her colony. And she lays eggs, and that's all she does. But the eggs she lays and the bees she hatches, they take on her temperament. So if you have a docile queen, you're going to have a docile hive. If you have an aggressive queen, you're going to have an aggressive hive. Her workers are the bulk of the bees in the colony. They are sterile females, the youngest of which are the nurse bees. They don't ever leave the colony. And then as they get older, they become foragers. So if you're out and about in your garden and you see bees that um, look kind of bedraggled, they might be missing a leg or have tattered wings, foragers are old and they're toward the end of their life and they often are looking pretty worn out. That's, that's pretty normal. Seasonally, there are also drones, and drones are the males. They are produced only when the colony feels it's necessary to um, try and reproduce itself. They are basically just deliverers of genetic material. That's all they're good for. They're stingless, they're clumsy flyers, they mate with a new queen, and then if they try and come back to the hive, the workers kill them. So they, they live for a short period of time. Okay. So why I got into beekeeping, um, I was really scared of bees. So I'm a gardener, I have a gardening business, and my yard is full of flowers and therefore it's full of bees. And um, I was really scared of them. So I figured the best way to get over my fear of bees is to do exactly what I did when my daughter started roller derby and I didn't know how to roller skate and I was really anxious about it and I was I was kind of scared of roller skating it was something I had never done before and I was in my mid-30s I learned to roller skate and became a referee right so this is the same thing if I'm going to get over my anxiety about bees I'm just going to go take on beekeeping and in doing so I've lost my fear of bees and I've gained a healthy respect and a greater understanding for the ecosystem in my garden so it's been really good. So I know a number of people who wanted to come over and see my bees were really, um, had communicated that they were scared of bees. And I think that's really normal to be scared of bees because they can sting you and, um, you know, it hurts and you can potentially get in serious shape if you are stung by a couple hundred of them. But um, if you have a safe way of interacting with them, you don't need to be afraid of them. And it's helped me have an easier time in the garden. I've been able to teach my kids not to be afraid of bees and two of my kids are beekeepers. So it's, it's really, um, it's really been a good thing in my life. Okay. So there are many kinds of hives. Um, like I said, the Langstroth hive is what you typically see out in a field. It's what commercial beekeepers use. It was invented in 1851. The Langstroth hive is a series of boxes. They're usually painted white bees like kind of they are attracted to that light color. Part of that reason is because if your beehive is sitting out in the middle of a field and it's painted a dark color in the heat of summer, the bees are going to have to spend a lot of work cooling the hive so that the brood doesn't overheat and the wax doesn't melt. So a lighter color hive um, is going to reflect that heat. That's why they're painted white. So a Langstroth hive is made up of a series of frames that um, stack into the box and as the colony grows you add another box on top so you'll see these large stacks of boxes each box full of brood or honey weighs about 60 pounds so um, they are not ideal for children or people with disabilities huffing a 60 pound box and we're talking a box 
where your center, like you have to hold it out like this, right? Because you don't want to, you can't like cradle the box of bees toward you. So um, they're difficult to work with. Um, they also don't work in the way that uh, bees want to build their combs. So there are a lot of issues with laying straw hives. I used to have one. I definitely prefer top bar beekeeping. Um, briefly, there's a kind of hive called a ware hive, which I am not, uh, it's not my area of expertise. Uh, Matt Reed, who used to own bee thinking in Portland and now works at Bee Built, he's probably the world expert on ware hives and they are a vertical top bar hive. So it's sort of a hybrid. Um, so you can research that if that interests you. So I have a Kenyan top bar hive and I have a cathedral hive. There is also the traditional method of beekeeping called a skep, which is basically a, an inverted basket. That was how beekeepers primarily kept bees before 1851. Totally different style of beekeeping and I won't get into that today, but today we're gonna to talk about top bar beekeeping, um, of which cathedral hives and Kenyan top bar hives are two kinds of top bars. So some of the pros of top bar beekeeping, scroll down here, we're gonna look at um, two different frames. So top bar beekeeping is much more in line with how the bees would want to build their hive. Um, I'm really big into ecological everything, ecological beekeeping. I want my trees to like, uh, and my garden to, to mimic things in nature as much as possible. It's how bees have evolved to live and it reduces stress if you can let them exhibit their full beeness, right? It's like having free range chickens versus uh, confined chickens in a, or, or free range cows versus feedlot cows, right? You want to let the cow exhibit its cowness and the chicken its chickenness and live how it's evolved to live. You want bees to build a colony the way they want to build it, they'll be healthier. So in this picture, the top um, section of comb is from a Langstroth hive. And you can see that it is a frame. It is um, a specific size and also it takes some significant woodworking skills to build to build these frames. So there is a, a foundation in the middle that used to be made out of wax that was pressed with a honeycomb imprint. And now typically those foundations are made out of plastic and bees don't like to build on plastic. They'll do it if they're forced to. The benefit for the industrial beekeeper is those plastic foundations can be reused ad nauseum and um, the wax ones obviously can't, they become part of the Come. But they are a, a blueprint or like a paint by number. Once that foundation is in there with that imprint, the bees have to build their comb for that specific hexagon shape. And you'll find in nature, and as we look at pictures later, the bees don't always build them um, so uh, like universally the same size. They will adjust the size and shape and diameter of the hexagon cells they're building for their needs. So this forces them to live a cookie cutter lifestyle that they might not want to live or is not best for their health, but it's most convenient for the beekeeper. So in the bottom, you see a bar, that's a top bar, and there's a little ridge on the bottom of it, it's flipped over, and on that ridge is where the bees um, will build their comb off of. There's no frame, there's no foundation, they get to build the comb however they wanna build it off that bar. Okay, so some of the benefits um, uh, of top bars is they were designed in Africa, to be made with the most basic of woodworking skills and scrap wood. So you can go to the rebuilding spend center and spend $30 and get enough lumber to build yourself a hive. A Langstroth hive, you need to have high, uh, you'd have significant woodworking skills and people typically buy those hives. So there are lots of plans on the internet for building your own Kenyan top bar hive and they're very simple and easy to follow if you have basic tools, okay. So one of the downsides of a top bar hive we're gonna look at is that um, it is a horizontal hive and therefore has a bigger footprint in your garden versus the vertical hive of uh, Langstroth. So when you're looking for a spot in your garden, you do need a bigger area to put a top bar hive. Okay, so we talked about some of these downsides. So in traditional beekeeping, not just in Langstroth hives, um, you are forcing the bees to build their comb on a plastic foundation right? You're using fungicides and antibiotics in your hive frequently. You're using pesticides for wax mods, varroa mites, and other pests. You're feeding, I don't know if you've seen, um, people tend to feed their bees sugar water during the winter or after they extract too much honey from the hive. So they feed them sugar water to keep them going. Um, another mode of traditional beekeeping is suppressing swarming in colonies. So the kind of hives I keep are top bars. The philosophy of beekeeping that I practice 
is um, called the stun method of beekeeping, which means sheer total utter neglect, which is great because I'm busy doing roller derby so and raising four kids. So um, having a low maintenance way of beekeeping works great for me. This term was coined by Mark Shepard, who's actually a regenerative agroforester. So he farms nuts. And I've applied this concept to beekeeping and I know other people have too. On Facebook, there's a great Facebook group called Treatment Free Beekeepers and they're mostly stun beekeepers. So um, when you think of beekeeping, you don't think of farming bees, you think of having a relationship with them in which you give them a home and food and perks and they give you their excess honey and wax and they pollinate your yard for you. So uh, they are low maintenance. What happens when you have a high maintenance kind of beekeeping is that you end up um, propping up weak genetics. So bees that are susceptible to varroa mites, you are ena enabling those colonies to reproduce by treating them heavily with pesticides and feeding them sugar water when in nature they would have just died. And the colonies that would have survived and reproduced are those that are resistant to varroa mites. So over time, what we have done as beekeepers by heavily involving ourselves in the colony is that we have created weaker bees that are less resilient. And I wanna create resilient bees. So there is a cost to that. It means sometimes your colonies are going to die. However, in Portland, the overwinter survival rate is between 40 and 50%, whether you treat your bees or not. Um, so I don't have any lower survival rate of my bees than people who actively spray with fungicides and pesticides. So before we launch the first video here, I just wanna make it clear if you're treating your bees with chemicals and you're feeding them sugar water, whatever you put into your bees, you're gonna be putting it into your body if you are eating their honey. I want my bees to make honey. I don't want them to make concentrated sugar water. I don't want my bees to be putting fungicides and um, insecticides into my body via their honey. So um, those are some reasons why I practice that kind of beekeeping. Okay, so I'm gonna queue up a video here so you can see what my two beehives look like. Give me one second. Nidhi, I'm going to stop you. Are you speaking in this video? Yes. Can you all hear it? We cannot hear the speaking part. Oh, no. Okay. Let me see if I can hear <laughs> that. Thank you for telling me that. Okay. Um, give me a second and let me see if I can fix that. Try your volume first. The there. volume is all the way up. Mm -hmm. I wonder why that is. You can't hear it. Still can't hear it. Okay. Well, I can just talk over it. Is that yes, okay? talk over it, do it. Okay. That's what I thought you were doing. And I was like, wow, she's giving us a minute to really sink into the scene. No, I talked in the videos, but that's okay. <laughs> I know what I said. So, okay. Um, actually, let me mute this then because it's going to drive me crazy because I can hear it loud and clear. Okay. Perfect. So, so this is my cathedral hive, which has a live colony in it. So what I'm talking about in the video um, is that uh, the, the colony is level and the, the fence is not. So you really need to make sure your top buyer beehives are level or your bees are going to build their colony. Their combs are going to be, and you will have a hard time getting them out. So um, you want to level your hive. And then I have a beekeeping permit and um, they tell you where in your yard you can keep your bees. You give them some suggestions and they tell you where you can have them. They have to be behind a privacy fence in Multnomah County. And that's because there's a high rate of theft of bees and um, a hive, they come and steal them overnight 
and a full hive with a colony in it is worth several hundred dollars. Whoa, so that's have, crazy. Yeah, well, just the hive, when you'll see my other top bar hive, it retailed for over $500. So um, empty. And then a colony, a healthy colony is another several hundred dollars. So um, let me pause this for one second. Oh, I'll let you look. So that, that beehive on the left is the Kenyan top bar hive. Um, both of these are, are two kinds of top bar hives. The Kenyan top bar hive has a copper top and a pivot lid, which I like a lot better. It's from a company called Bee Thinking, which went out of business. Um, they made high-end hives. You can sometimes find them for sale on Craigslist and they are worth every penny. Again, that hive retailed empty, $500. So if you can find one used for less, it's well worth it. Very qual high quality, well-made beehive. Um, this cathedral hive was a gift. I'm gonna pause this real quick. It was a gift from my friend, um, Holly, um, Holly Nass, who's a skater. And the cathedral hive looked like it was homemade and my dad and I made a frame to house it. You wanna keep your beehive up off the ground. Um, and um, both of these hives could be constructed with simple tools. Um, so um, let me keep going here. So I'm in the, the backyard in this part of the video with no bee suit on and you can see how close I am to the hives and the bees are not gonna be ticked off. So now I'm gonna show you the entrance to the hive. And I'm right next to the bees and I'm not posing any threat and they're not stinging me and I'm wearing an overall a pair of overalls and a tank top like it's totally fine. Um, so here you can see the bees coming in and out. And one of the things I was um, wanting to get across for this is the flight path that the bees have going to and from the colony. Um, they come out and they go pretty much straight up. So you don't need to have a wide area in your yard where they're gonna be flying at a low level. They go straight up and they go two to three miles from the hive to forage. So um, that means you can put them in a more compact area. You also wanna put them somewhere with morning sun and afternoon shade. Morning sun helps them wake up and get going. Afternoon shade means they spend less energy cooling the hive in summer. Let's see here. How much time I have left on this video? Yes, I'm talking about the flight path straight up and out. That is a concern for neighbors. So again, I had to get a beekeeping permit. My permit was for two bees. I know Multnomah County has changed, two beehives. Multnomah County has changed some of their beekeeping uh, permit process since then. But you really should check with your county and the ordinances for beekeeping. Um, before it was $500 per day fine if you had an illegal beehive in my county and someone turned you in. So it was pretty steep. So you wanna really check. And also do an, a good job of educating your neighbors that they don't need, need to be afraid. There's not gonna be a lot of bees down um, near human level. They're gonna take off and go way away and then come back. And you can see again how close I got to the hive and it was no problem. Okay. Nitty, I'm surprised they can both, the, the bee hives are so close to each other. So yeah. you can pack them in. Oh yeah, I could have a whole yard full of bees. Most people have an apiary or a bee yard and you can stack them all right next to each other because they're not foraging in the same places. They're not gonna bother each other. If one colony is weak or distressed, they may rob from each other and that's probably a more advanced issue to deal with, but um, yeah. Okay, so moving on here. Um, okay, so yeah, I did. Try and think about my philosophy is that I'm a guardian of the bees. I host them in my yard and I don't micromanage them, right? Um, just like I don't want to micromanage my chickens and I don't want to micromanage my ducks. I want to let them just live their lives how they want to live them. And then I collect the eggs, right? So this is sort of the same. Uh, here you can see in this picture, brand new comb that is being formed on the bottom of the top bar. Okay. Okay, so talked about this a little bit in the video. What do bees need? They need a sheltered location with morning sun. Winter winds are gonna be, and winter driving rain is gonna be not a good thing for your bees. So you can build a covered area and in areas with a more severe winters, you can, you can have that covered. Also will um, increase the, the lifetime of your hive before you need to replace it. I don't yet have a covered area. It's on my list of projects. I just haven't done it yet. And because my one top bar hive has a copper roof, it really um, doesn't need one. So bees need bee forage. So in Oregon, we have bees foraging as early as February. If it's nice weather, if it's above about 50 degrees, you'll see bees out and they will come out in small groups and they will do what's called cleansing flights, which is where they're cleaning poop out of the hive when it's warm enough to fly and they'll dump it in the yard. 
But if it's warm enough and there are things blooming, they will collect nectar at that time. So rosemary is usually the first thing blooming in my garden. And um, crocus is another good one. And dandelions are an excellent early food for bees. So I want to try and have things blooming all year long, all the way into November, if I can possibly go that long, um, so that the bees have a constant supply of nectar and from things that they enjoy feeding off of. So bees like simple open faced flowers. If you have like a, a very complicated, um, fancy variety of rose with a bazillion ruffled petals, they can't get in there and they can't access the nectar and the pollen. But an old fashioned like Rosa rugosa, the bees are going to love that and feed on it all the time. Um, bees need a lot of water in the summer. You often will see bees in kiddie pools drowning or in your bird bath. They need a bee waterer. So what I do is I put out pie plates or ceramic dishes and pebbles or seashells and then put water in it. And that gives the bees a place to perch and drink without drowning. And they use the water as an air conditioner in the summer to keep the brood from cooking and to keep the wax from melting. So a beeswax melts at like 86 degrees. So, um, and they, you will often see bees doing this thing called bearding. They're hanging off the outside of the hive, fanning their wings. They're making themselves an air conditioner um, to cool off the inside of the hive. Winter insulation. In Oregon, I don't insulate my hives. We have pretty mild winters. So um, you should look for your climate if you need to insulate your hive. Here in Oregon, if you add winter insulation, the problem is moisture accum accumulation and mold. So because we have such wet winters, I don't do anything to insulate the hive. Um, but you should check for your area. If you're beekeeping in Maine, you probably need to insulate your hive over the winter, especially if you have an Italian strain of bees. They're not very hardy for the winter. The, the last thing that bees really need is they need no spraying. Please encourage your neighbors not to spray pesticides and fungicides and herbicides. If they have to spray them, they need to not spray them when the flowers are open and they need to spray them after dusk when the bees are in the hive. So if you have to spray, I have an organic garden. Sometimes I spray copper fungicide because uh, we live in Oregon. We have lots of uh, fungal problems on our trees. You spray when things are not flowering and you spray at night so that you are not accidentally spraying bees. Okay, so what do beekeepers need? Um, I'm gonna queue up a few videos real quick and I might have to talk over them. Okay, so let me go to the next module. Okay, so um, these are the three main tools that I use. So this is a, a brush and it has propolis all over it because I accidentally left it in the hive for about two weeks one time. And the bees glue everything together that you leave in the hive with propolis. Um, um, talking about my bee suit, there's a elastic over the thumb so that your sleeves can't hike up and you can't get bees up your suit. So bees, you have this brush to brush excess bees off the comb. One of the quickest ways to get stung is to roll a bee. So if you have a bee on you, if you go like this, you're going to get stung. This thing, that ticks bees off. So if you are brushing comb, you don't want to roll. You don't want to use it like a brush. You want to um, tap. You want to use a tapping motion to knock bees off the comb, and then you want to tick them off. I use a um, kitchen knife, and then I have a wrought iron uh, hive tool. And those you use to pry the bars up. So everything in the hive is going to be glued together with propolis and um, that's that red resinous substance all over the hive and you have to pry things up to get access to them. So that hive tool is a really nice expensive one from Bee Thinking. I will say um, I run a gardening program for a nonprofit and Bee Thinking donated um, that really nice hive that I have because um, someone dropped it and dented the copper lid so they couldn't sell it um, and then they donated some of the tools too. So um, and then this is really great for just a regular kitchen knife that's not sharp um, for cutting comb and for popping up things that are stuck in the hive. You don't need to have a really sharp knife. So those are the three, the three basic tools that you need. Um, and you can get away with not getting a fancy hive tool. You can just use a knife. Uh, but the brush you definitely need because you're going to have to, when you harvest honey, the bees are going to want to come with you and that honeycomb, you'll need to brush them off. Also a smoker. You're going to need a smoker. That's the last tool that you need. So... Um, How expensive is the uh, tool that you said that we do need, the brush tool? Okay, let me um, go back here. Oh, it wants to stop doing that. Okay. Um, so in total, the brush tool runs between $7 and $14. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a breakdown of costs. So um, 
you can buy more high-end uh, gloves and hood and jacket. Um, that's about what they cost retail here in Portland. Um, and the hive tools, um, yeah, you can get away with a brush. You do need a smoker. So I'm going to do my smoker video in a second. Um, mm -hmm. And um, again, you might need to check your county. In Portland, it was $25 for a lifetime permit for, for beekeeping. So they didn't want to make it prohibitive. What they what they wanted is to make sure people were doing hobby beekeeping and they didn't have like 30 hives and running a business in their backyard. And they wanted to make sure that the bees were set up in a way that they were being cared for properly. So, um, oh, I'm getting the sunset in this window. Um, so let me pull up the video about the smoker really quickly. Cool. Oh, I'm really sad that you're not gonna be able to see or hear the audio on some of these. Okay, hang on. I wonder if I mute me if the audio will go. Can I try that, Kat? Nope. Everyone's chiming in that they're enjoying hearing you're talking. So I think you're just fine. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Um, so let me mute this. Okay, so this is about lighting a smoker and why you use a smoker tool. So this is a good investment, 25 to $40. Um, and it is your main tool for calming the bees if they're starting to get upset. So a smoker runs um, on, I usually use like toilet paper rolls or a paper bag of torn up leaves and then some chunks of wood around the garden. And before you get into the hive, you need to get your smoker going because when you have a full bee suit on, you can't then start your smoker and wait for it to get going. So do this first before you get into the hive. So a smoker is made up of um, the bellows and then there's obviously a metal container. So when you are smoking bees, um, this is the main way to calm them down if they're getting angry. However, the smoke stimulates the bees because they um, instinctively fear a forest fire because when they smell smoke, there's gonna be a fire. So what they do is they go into the colony and they start gorging themselves on honey and they get ready to abscond and leave. So it's a stress response. So I try not to use it. If I can at all avoid smoking, I wanna avoid smoking because you're gonna stress the bees out. Yeah, they'll, they'll stop paying attention to you and they will go into the colony and they'll start feeding on honey and they won't be aggressive toward you because they're far more worried about a forest fire than they are about you meddling in the hive. Um, so that's the, the, the thinking behind using a smoker. So I don't use it unless I absolutely have to. And then I, I want to use it really judiciously and I don't want to puff a whole bunch of smoke into the hive. I want to just go and do enough that the bees kind of chill out and they stop bothering me. Um, so, um, yeah, so a smoker tool is really good. It can help calm the bees so that you don't have to close the hive and get out, but you don't want to overdo it. Okay. So. I'm mentioning that the top of that gets really hot. Don't burn your hand. Um, only handle the bellows on the smoker tool. Um, that little handle is okay, but don't touch the top. You'll burn the crap out of your hand. Um, so um, once you fill it and get it going, it'll, it'll stay lit for a really long time. Um, all, the whole, by a long time, I mean like half an hour, however long you need to be in the hive. I've never been inside a hive more than half an hour. Um, that's a sure way to get them very upset with you. So the smoker gets going and um, once that is lit, then I'm ready to start thinking about getting on my bee suit. Okay. So, so a bee suit. Okay. This is one where I talk a bunch and I'm sad. Okay. Um, oh no, it's not that one yet. Hang on. Let me find out where that one went. Hang on one second, y'all. Um, Look at Nitty's fabulous use of our new training platform for Rose City. We're using technology. It's really easy. I'm really technologically um, impaired and it was easy for me to use. Okay, Pretty so awesome. I'm trying to, tell me if you can hear this. I'm trying it from a different load. Can you hear it? No. No. Dang, okay. Okay, so you can just watch me being doing nothing. Okay. So this is where I'm talking about what I wear into the, go into the hive. Okay. Um, 
So I don't wear a full beekeeping suit. I don't wear pants. I wear overalls and I wear, um, or jeans and I tuck them into my socks and then wear boots. And then I wear a beekeeping jacket and a hood and I wear gloves. So, um, when you, um, wear your beekeeping suit into the area with the bees, the biggest problem. Oh, so a suit is sting resistant. It's not sting proof, but I've never been stung through my suit. I've been stung through my gloves. Um, I wear, so if you get, a, if you get into the area with your bees and the way you're going to get into trouble is if you don't have it properly sealed up and you get a bee inside your suit. Uh, and then what you want to do is you want to be stripping that suit off as fast as you can because that bee doesn't want to be cooped up with you and it's in there because it's mad at you. So, um, so I'm going to pause this. Okay. Um, so when you, uh, when I wear my hood, I don't wear earrings because if I'm stripping it off really quickly because of an emergency, I don't want to catch an earring. And I also wear my hair back. So I wear a bandana or a hat. And the reason for that is that um, you are wearing this cage around your face and you're bending down and you're picking up tools and you're messing with things. If your hair gets in your face, you have no way to tuck it behind your ear. So I always put my hair back. Okay. Um, so I don't know if we actually have to watch the rest of this video or I can just talk about it because I feel weird having everybody watch me. Okay. So, um, Let's see if there's any actual video. Okay, so um, I'm gonna go back to this really quickly. So when you are wearing your beekeeping suit, um, you want to make sure that you have it thoroughly sealed up. So um, you have two zippers that are horizontal and then a vertical zipper and they all overlap each other. And then you have a flap of um, Velcro. Let's see if I can show it here. Um, there we go. Okay. So you have a flap of Velcro. And um, it, the only time I've had bees get in my suit is when I was lazy and I didn't bother zipping up my hood. Um, they uh, know how to get through the tiniest holes. So really make sure that if you don't want to be in your suit, make sure all of your um, entrances are closed. So that's one reason that you have elastic on your jacket and your gloves that go over go up really high and there's elastic on them. And um, yeah, so typically I don't have, I don't wear beekeeping pants because I don't have bees stinging my legs. Bees are attracted to carbon dioxide. And by attracted, I mean their defense mechanism is triggered by carbon dioxide. So if you have um, uh, ticked off bees, what they're going to go for is the source of carbon dioxide. In nature, it would be a bear going into the hive wanting to rob honey and it'd be breathing all in the hive. That's going to trigger them to sting. So if if you get stung in the hand, it's typically because you've squished a bee. If you get stung in the face, it's because you've pissed off a colony. So um, they are going to go straight for the face. Um, I don't want that to scare people. If you don't get your face in there and you don't breathe into the colony, you don't talk loudly into it, and you pay attention to the way the bees are communicating with you, you won't get stung in the face um, if you don't get a bee in your suit. So for me, the bees don't want to sting you. If they sting you, they die, right? So bumblebees can sting you repeatedly because they don't have a barbed stinger. Wasps can sting you repeatedly because they don't have a barbed stinger. European honeybees sting you once and they die. Pulls all their guts out when they sting you. So they don't wanna do that. So what you have with honeybees is um, they communicate with you. And one of the great things about being a beekeeper is you learn to speak their language. So the bees are going to start by um, they have a normal buzzing when you open the hive and as they get a little grumpy, the pitch lowers and the buzzing gets louder and they just sound irritated. And it doesn't take very long in beekeeping to know the difference and to hear what they're communicating to you. They're saying, we're getting really, we're getting a little grumpy. We're getting a little grumpy. The second thing that happens is the bees start flying into you and they fly into your hood and they fly into your suit and they bump you. It's like getting a shoulder check, right? They fly into you and that is telling you back off. We are getting angry and the next thing we're gonna do is sting you. So once you feel those bees flying into you and bouncing off, you know that you need to smoke them or you need to close the hive and you need to come back another day. Um, so bees don't wanna sting you and they don't wanna die. So if you're aware of the fact that they can speak to you and warn you, it's like a dog growls before it's gonna snap at you, right? If you can read their language, you're not gonna get stung. Um, you're gonna be okay. However, um, bees can sting. So on my list of things you need is you need a bee sting kit. The only times I've been stung, I have squeezed bees or I have had them on me and not realized and I've rolled, rolled them. Okay. 
So you need to keep Benadryl, you need to keep an EpiPen. Anybody can develop a life-threatening bee sting allergy at any time. You need to have an EpiPen and you need to have it within reach of your beehive when you're working in there. So mine is in the mudroom, right? Out my back door, right? Um, I also like make a plantain and calendula salve that's really nice, or you can use hydrocortisone cream because the second half of healing from a bee sting is very itchy. So, um, and you also can keep ibuprofen. But if you're gonna be a beekeeper, you need to have your doctor prescribe you an EpiPen. Um, Nitty, how often have you been stung? Is it like once a month? Oh, that's a good question. I have been four, stung four times ever. So, oh, that's fantastic. Uh, so if I get stung on the hand, uh, this is what we should talk about briefly, what is a normal reaction to a bee sting? Um, you don't need to go to the doctor unless you have shortness of breath and a lot of facial swelling. I get stung on the hand, I will swell all the way to the elbow, my whole arm will swell up. That's why I wear gloves and a hood and a jacket every time. Um, that's considered a normal, moderate reaction to a bee sting and it doesn't make you more likely to develop a bee sting allergy. Um, but that is within the scope of a normal reaction. So I'm very careful. I've been stung by bumblebees more times than I've been stung by honeybees. And that's just by nature of working in the garden and picking flowers and grabbing things in the garden. Um, I've been stung by bumblebees a lot more times than honeybees. Cool. Um, and you've yeah. got about 10 more minutes till the Q&A. Sweet. Okay. So um, I'm actually doing great. So we're going to skip over this section. This is really what in a more detailed class we would go over. What are all the things that can go really wrong? Um, uh, it's just, it's too much to cover for today. So I'm going to scroll on past that. Um, inside the hive. So this is what you can expect to find when you open a hive. This is my oldest child, Ruth. She's an avid beekeeper and she is 0% afraid of bees. But also when she gets stung, she basically doesn't react at all. It like hurts and then she gets like a tiny little red area and then it's done. Okay. So here you can see what the top bar looks like with no frame and no foundation. They make a triangle because that's the shape of the wood in the bottom of the hive. Here you can see um, there's gooey stuff on the top of the bar and that's propolis. It's made from um, tree bud resin and it is what they use to seal every hole in the hive. And if like a mouse gets into the hive in the winter, they'll sting it to death and then they'll cocoon it in propolis. It's really cool. It's, I've never had that happen, but I've seen pictures on the internet, it's cool. Then you'll get beeswax. These are secreted, uh, beeswax is secreted by glands on the belly of the worker. It's white when it's brand new. So there was that picture I showed earlier of new honeycomb, it's white. As it ages, it darkens and honeycomb is reused over and over. So it'll start out having brood in it, which will be um, the, the eggs and babies. And then later they'll fill it with honey. And so it darkens as it ages. As it ages, it also gets more rigid. So on a hot day, if you are working with brand new comb, it's very fragile and it can break. So I always want to go into the colony in the morning and when it's below 80 degrees out, if I can. Because so, broken bee comb is, that's also something for another class. Reattaching comb that you break off is a big pain. Um, so here you can see also in the picture, uncapped honey and capped honey. So uncapped honey, you don't want to harvest it. If you've ever bought a jar of honey and it's exploded in your cabinet, um, that's because it is honey that is uncapped. It is not evaporated enough to, um, uh, be shelf stable, right? So capped honey, you can see in the picture, there's a little thin coating of wax that is sealed honey. It has no expiration. It will keep for a thousand years. And that's the bees food store, right? The other thing that you'll see is lower down, there are some dark spots that are darker spots. That's pollen. So bee bread is the bees primary source of protein. So they harvest nectar and they harvest pollen. Um, the pollen may look different colors in the hive. So people often think they have mold in the hive because some of the cells are filled with gray, purple, white, brown matter. That's all bee bread, um, which you can eat. You can eat it. Um, and then obviously there's the brood, there's the babies in the hive. So, okay, I'm gonna queue up this video and we won't watch the whole thing. And let's see here. Thanks for being patient. Okay, so this is what it looks like inside the cathedral hive. I took the top off of that hive. And let me mute it so I can't hear myself talking, okay. So you can see the top bars, instead of being flat bars, they are um, three-sided. And that makes the comb more stable because they can build on three sides. And in the bottom, uh, the shape of the hive means they build a, a hexagonal piece of comb. And it's much more stable and less likely to break. So you can see the entrance on the right. 
the bees start building there. So the queen and um, her entourage and a lot of the brood is going to be at the right end of the colony. And as the colony grows, they're going to build across to the left until they fill it. Each bar will um, contain, uh, at the right end, will contain a lot of brood and some honey and some pollen. If you have a non-commercial kind of uh, beehive, you won't have a queen separator. So you will end up with brood in other parts of the hive. As they build out and farther down, it's gonna be almost all honey. And there may be pollen mixed in and there's sometimes maybe brood, but it will be mostly honey. So um, you can see as I'm pointing, starting about right here, that that's all honey right now. And then the rest, it all empty. So by the end of summer, they'll probably have the whole thing full of honey and I'll be able to take some and harvest it. I don't wanna harvest in the spring. I wanna wait until they've had a chance for the blackberries to bloom. That's their primary source of nectar in Oregon is invasive Himalayan blackberries. And then I want them to be able to cap that off and then I can harvest it. I also don't harvest right before winter because I want them to have stores of honey. So some people harvest in October. I don't wanna do that. I wanna take leftovers. So that's what it looks like inside. And then um, I had to put the camera down in order to take pictures. This is new, new comb that they're building out and they are starting to fill with honey. So you can see how white it is when it's new. Wow, that's beautiful. Uh, yeah. And no, nobody tried to sting me, nobody was aggressive. It was fine. Now when you put the top bar back, you, you might squish bees. You can see how tightly packed the bars are. So I do like a gentle rocking motion and I slowly rock the bars into place so the bees have time to get out of the way. That way I squished probably three bees instead of 20 when I was in the hive, so. Nitty, Max and I were listening and we heard you say that they build from right to left. Can you explain that a little bit more? Oh yeah, it's because um, that's where I dumped the colony in on the right side and I, oh, have a, okay. I, have, I have a partition. And so when you put the bees in, you don't wanna give them access to the whole colony right away or they will build comb crooked. And so you have a, a wooden board that you open up more and more and more of the colony as they grow. So when you catch a swarm, it's not nearly as big. And so they don't need as much space. And that way you can kind of um, open up the space as they need it. And the super basic question from Nicole, when you say yeah. brood, you mean that's the part of the hive where the bees live and sleep? Oh, that's a good question. Brood is the part of the hive where the eggs and the larvae are. Mm. The, oh, the nursery. Yeah, it's the baby nursery. Yeah. Um, so it's where the queen is too. She's roaming around in there laying eggs. So, um, and she has um, an entourage of bees that take care of her. Um, and the bees, um, they can kind of sleep or nap anywhere in the hive. They don't all necessarily stay down at that end. That's just where all the babies are. So um, I'm going to scroll down and show you some more pictures. I don't know if I have time to watch the video. My Kenyan top bar hive did not make it through the winter. It actually died in the fall. So remember we talked about the survival rate being 40 to 50%. Um, part of that is because we've let bees, uh, bees are not very resilient. We've bred them to be not very hardy. Um, also because of pesticide pressures, varroa mite pressures, things like that. Um, I'm used to having to catch a swarm almost every year to fill my two hives. Um, so this is what the other hive looked like before it died. So you can see I flipped the bar upside down and set it down. I could do that without it breaking because it's older comb. So at the beginning of the video, uh, the presentation, we talked about how when you're using um, industrial beekeeping techniques and you're using a foundation, the bees have to build their comb all uniform. Here you can see what they build it like when they want to build it, right? So there are slightly different sizes and shapes. And at the bottom of the bar, which is actually the top when it's hanging, they have a little bee highway. So they will make channels and roads through the hive however they want, um, which is why it's important that you put bars back the way you found them. Um, that way they can tunnel through for ventilation and for travel however they want. So I find it really fascinating that while they build hexagon cells, you can see capped honey um, and then you can see uncapped honey here. They also will vary the size and um, the shape of the comb for what they need. So, um, okay, here's my last slide and then we'll do questions. Is that okay? Um, so being an, okay, being a natural beekeeper means um, you get a partake in a really fun hobby that you check on them maybe once a month for 15 or 20 minutes. And um, when you harvest the honey, it depends on how much you wanna take and what method you use. I use the crush and strain method or we actually eat the honeycomb. So you cut the, the honey off and you just crush it in a sieve and put it in a sunny window and let it drain into a bowl. It's really easy. I don't need an industrial extractor because I'm only working with like 20 or 30 pounds of honey a year. Um, so it's really minimal output on your part. Um, you become a guardian of the bees. You 
increase pollination in your garden and all of your neighbors' gardens. And you have honey to share with your neighbors. Um, you have wax and other products. For every eight pounds of honey, you'll get one pound of wax and you can make candles or salves or whatever you want. I make salves with the wax that I harvest. Um, yeah, so it's a really fun and fulfilling hobby that's sort of minimal um, time obligation. So yeah, thanks. Do y'all have other questions? People do, we have a number of questions. Um, okay, so we I'm gonna go, can I turn my screen share off here? Let's yeah, turn on your screen share. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Okay, a couple questions. Uh, pets, what are we gonna do if a pets get if our pets get stung by the bees? Oh, that's a great question. So uh, dogs tend to not react that strongly and also dogs get stung like once and they know to keep away. So again, we, we showed that I keep the bees up on a stand and therefore um, their exit trajectory as we saw was pretty high. So bees aren't exiting at the face level of a dog and my dogs have never been stung. Um, cool. So yeah, it's pretty low risk, yeah. Cool. Um, is there a specific time of year that the bees swarm or is it just dependent on their growth as a colony? Caitlin wants to know. Oh yeah, late spring. So right now is the beginning of swarm season. So April and May. Um, sometimes they will swarm in June and July and by then the problem is the swarm is so late in the year that they may not have time to establish enough of a colony to make it through the winter. So right now if you have a swarm that you see and it's not like 25 feet up tree and you live in Portland, message me and I'll come get it because I have one empty hive. Um, swarms are very docile, by the way. They don't want to sting. So I've never been stung working with a swarm. I can handle bees in a swarm with my gloves off. They don't want to sting you. They're super docile. They're that's just bees very, looking for a new home. So That's very interesting and also makes me think if I had invested hundreds of dollars in a bee swarm and then they just go away to someone else, I would be sad. So that's part of the reason that I catch a swarm is that if you, if you buy bees, they may abscond from your hive and you've spent $120 on a, a nucleus of bees and they would rather go somewhere else. So when a bee's hive swarms, it's, it's throwing off part of the colony with a new queen. So you won't lose your whole hive for the most part, unless they abscond. You will keep yours and then they will, that's how they reproduce, right? So they form a new colony. Um, yeah. Oh my gosh, the questions are literally swarming in sorry okay um had to had to go there uh really quickly what does a nurse bee do oh a nurse bee her job is to um clean and care for um the eggs and make sure when they need to be capped and uncapped and also take care of the young bees and then when they are um, pupating she takes care of them and just keeps them clean and cool and then helps the um, newly adult bees emerge from the cell yeah, there's a lot of cleanup, so. And Caitlin was asking how large of a yard or how many plants do you need to support them? But I believe that you answered that because you were saying that they go straight up and then out for about three miles. So you don't actually need a lot of plants right there, am I right? Odds are most of the bees in my backyard are not from my hives. So uh, they do feed in my yard. I mean, I definitely can see them coming out of the hive and going to plants in my yard, but they do feed up to three miles away. So you don't have to support them all by your garden, yeah. Cool. And if you have both a bee water and a bird bath, will the bees be able to tell the difference? Or do you need to keep bird baths just out of your yard if you have bees? No, no. I mean, I have a bird bath. Um, I have a duck pond. So um, uh, you may end up with some bees drowned, but they, they would rather find water somewhere they can perch. So, and so they'll go for the bee water. I mean, they're like us. If they know they can't swim, they're they will only go to a deep body of water if they have no other choice. So give them a shallow body of water and they'll be happy. Yeah. Cool. When you get the honey, do you have to crush the comb or is the cathedral less invasive way of harvesting honey? You just, you just cut it with a knife and drop it into a bowl. Mm -hmm. And then you can eat the whole, um, you can eat the wax. It's totally edible. Um, comb in honey is actually, if you're a beekeeper and you're selling honey at market, Comb in honey commands a higher price. Um, and, or, so uh, you don't want to, you can't crush it in the hive, right, obviously. So you cut the whole comb off. If you don't want to use the wax, you put it outside next to the bees once you've removed the honey and they will clean all that wax up and recycle it, so. Cool, and everyone's wondering about the video and slides. Will we have access to them? Yes, because they're already all loaded into CoAssemble. So I'll be able to send out a link and also we're recording this so that we can put it on the YouTube channel. 
Yeah, and I have a YouTube channel. It's Park Rose Permaculture, and all of those videos are on my channel, and there is audio. So if you want to rewatch them and have audio instead of me just rambling on top of them, um, you can do it that way. Um, if, if you find you have a varamite or wax moth infestation, do you destroy yes. the colony? Well, that's a good question. Um, no. So Varroa mites are pretty universal right now. Varroa destructor is a relatively recent pest. Um, there are more and more bees that are becoming resistant to it and that they will clean the Varroa mites off of each other. So um, folks are hoping to perpetuate those kind of bees and have those genetics where they can take care of the Varroa mites themselves. Um, there are treatments for Varroa mites that are organic. Um, unfortunately, it's a huge pressure on bees. The, Wax moths, any colony is going to have some wax moths, just like it's going to have some ants in it. They're not a huge pressure um, on the bees unless the colony is already weak from other, other problems. You tend to get a lot of wax moths. Once the colony has died, they'll come in and clean out all the wax, but it's not a big problem usually. That's a good question, cleaning out a colony when they, when they do go elsewhere. Is that a big oh, project? Yeah, so the, the video that I didn't get to show, which is on my YouTube channel, is... Um, what the inside of the Kenyan top bar hive looked like, which was dead, right? So it, um, you don't clean out the colony. Some people think you need to bleach it out and clean it out. Actually, bees are attracted to the smell of a, a previously used home. So if it's got wax in it, if it's got some vestiges of honey in it, you are more likely to get a colony moving in without having to catch a swarm. Um, so bees are fastidiously clean. So if they move into a cavity or an empty beehive, they will clean it out. They'll get rid of all the spiders, the spider webs, the moth cocoons, um, any mold in there. They will clean all of that out and they will set up the hive how they want. They don't want a bleached, cleaned out hive. You let them do the housekeeping because they know what they like better than you do. So it's really easy. You don't do anything. Um, when you say that the colony is dead, has the whole colony died or just the queen? Oh, that's a good question too. So the whole colony died um, in the fall. And a lot of times if you have sudden loss of your entire colony, that's due to pesticides and herbicides. Um, but often it's unknown. Um, sometimes you get, um, and, and you get where like all of the bees are just gone and there's just a few dead bees and you don't know what happened. That's a, a common occurrence in modern beekeeping. And we don't really understand why that happens. Um, if the queen dies, if the colony has already created queen cells before she died, they'll just grow a new queen. So you can have, um, the queen I have now is probably not the queen that I had when I caught that swarm. They requeen themselves whenever they want. And if you have a queen with a nasty temperament and makes your whole colony aggressive, you can squish her. As long as there are queen cells <laughs> made, which, um, sorry, I didn't get time to show them, the colony will go ahead and make a new queen. You can squish the old queen and the new queen will be uh, hopefully more docile. That's amazing, and I can see why this is normally a three-part class as we start to answer some of these questions. Two more questions, and then anyone else will just have to get in touch with you uh, privately, but this has yeah. been a great intro. Will bees harvest closest flowers to the colony, or will they claim a flower area, and that can be arbitrary to what's in your yard? Like, do they go to the same place over and over, I think is the question. Oh, if a bee finds like a, a f they want a large swath where everything is the same, so they actually tend to put the same type of honey all together. So they'll go do a mass feeding on like blackberries and then they'll find us, you know, like a swath of roses and then they'll, they'll feed on them and you'll find the honey will be different colors and, it, and the pollen as well. It's fairly organized in the hive. That's how you can tell what, what kind of honey you have once you're familiar with what different pollens and honeys look and taste like. Um, so they, a worker will come back and be like, oh my God, you guys, guess what? I found this huge field full of buckwheat. Let's all go. And then they'll all go feed there. And then they'll um, exhaust another source. So it tends to be pretty organized. Awesome. We have a great final question taking us right to the pinpoint of an hour. So good job. Uh, Shell says, if someone watching this right now inherited some Langstroth hives, could you help locate a swarm to them if you run across one? Or how do you lay out a vacancy sign in your hive? That's a great question. So Portland Urban Beekeepers is a Facebook group and their job is to connect people um, with empty hives and who want to get into beekeeping with swarms. And they have a swarm line and you can get on it. And if there is a swarm within five miles of your house, they will text you. And if you want help catching a swarm, I would love to help you, Shell, or whoever else. Um, yeah, that was, that's funny because that yeah. explains a lot. My friend, one time I was at dinner at their house and he like ran out and was just gone. And it was uh -huh. because there was a swarm and I did not understand how he got the bat signal, but that explains a lot. 
Yeah, it's a great service. So that's Portland Urban Beekeeper. And there's a group and a website. This has been awesome and super fascinating. The feedback has been phenomenal. Everybody's super jazzed about it. I'm sure it's going to get a lot of shares. Thank you for putting all this together, Nitty. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for having me, guys. Appreciate awesome. it. Have a good night. Thanks, you too. Bye. Bye.